just a reminder that what we were talking about last time was uh, Blasius' theorem. And we showed in the last lecture that the force on a body in uh, any flow, on a two-dimensional body, is given by a contour integral around the boundary of the body. Uh, we talked about the complex potential W and we showed that the, uh, the complex force, so a combination of the force in the x and the y direction, is a contour integral of uh, the derivative of the potential squared multiplied by i times the density rho divided by 2. Okay? And on the second problem sheet, you'll see that you can derive a similar result for the moment. And just a reminder that the moment on a body is a cross product of the position vector and the element of force. So if you're thinking about the moment on a body and integrating around the surface, you need to think carefully about what the, in, uh, the incremental bit of force is on each part of the body. Today, what I wanted to do is start to use Blasius' theorem to calculate forces on bodies. And to start with, um, I wanted to think about a problem that we've already thought about, which is uniform flow past a circular cylinder. So that's something we dealt with, um, I think, in lecture five. Um, but I wanted to do it from the point of view of this complex potential that we've developed. So that's um, the first example. So we're talking about uniform flow past a cylinder. And the problem that we've already considered, so we'll do again just for comparative purposes, is to think about the flow without any circulation. OK, so we've already seen that what the complex potential is. We did that in the last lecture. So we saw that W of Z can be calculated using Milne-Thompson's circle theorem. And the result of that is that you find uh, there's a UZ, which is the complex potential of the uniform stream. And then the term that you get when you use the circle theorem gives you plus A squared over Z, where A is the radius of the cylinder. So what we need to do to use Blasius' theorem is first of all differentiate this. OK, so we do that straight away. So if I differentiate this, I just get 1 minus a squared over z squared. And then if I do the integral uh, that the Blasius' theorem tells me to do, so I've got my i rho over 2. I'm going to be squaring this, so I have u squared. And for the moment, I'll just expand out the, um, the integrand. So I've taken out a factor of u squared. I've got 1 minus 2 a squared over z squared plus a to the 4 over z to the 4 dz. OK? And we talked last time how when we're doing these contour integrals, what we really care about is a term that has a 1 over z. And I gave you sort of a very informal justification that you'd sort of, based on sort of A-level ideas about what's special about 1 over z. But in this case, we can see that there is no 1 over z term. There's singularities like 1 over z squared, a double pole and a quadruple pole, but there's no simple pole. So using um, the, the residue theorem, we see straight away that this is just equal to 0. OK, so this is actually, as I say, this is a problem we've thought about before uh, from the point of view of calculating the velocity potential phi. And we've just redone this calculation using the more general framework that we've developed. But we've got the same answer, so that's good. The bad thing is that we've still found that there's no force, there's no net force on a cylinder uh, in a uniform flow. And that's something that we called d'Alembert's paradox previously. Okay, so it's exactly the same thing that we saw before. And I think it was example three in lecture five, if you want to look back at how we dealt with that problem or how we found that problem last time. 
But this is kind of a bit of a problem in that it's not what we expect from everyday life. And I wanted to try and, if you haven't seen the demonstration before, I wanted to show you that there is a drag force on things. So I'm going to try and do a demo if I don't get too tied up with my extension need. So you've possibly seen this kind of thing at a science museum somewhere where you take a hairdryer and you just put it on and you use a ping pong ball and just watch what happens to the ping pong ball afterwards. Okay, so I'm going to try and turn it on and then and if I increase the velocity Okay, so you see that the ping pong ball is clearly subject to a force from the flow induced by the hairdryer, okay? And you can conclude then that this calculation that we're doing from D'Alembert's paradox is maybe not quite what's happening in reality. And the question is, what can we do that might explain things? And the first thing that you might think, based on what we talked about in the last lecture, is thinking about the role of circulation. That's the calculation we did last time, was to think about what happens if there's some circulation about the cylinder. And remember, the reason that that might be relevant is that when we did Milne-Thompson circle theorem, we said there could be an additional term in minus i gamma over 2 pi log z that we can't rule out in general. So what I'm going to do now is repeat this calculation, but with some circulation. So uniform flow past the circular cylinder with circulation gamma. OK, so again, we talked about that in the last lecture and the complex potential that we found then so that's what we found on Wednesday's, in Wednesday's lecture, was exactly the same as that above. So u z plus a squared over z minus i gamma over 2 pi log z. Okay? And you might remember that the reason we can't rule this out is because it has it, this, the contribution from this um, point vortex essentially decays in the far field and it still has mod z equals a as a streamline. So we have to allow for this possibility. OK, so what I want to do now is think about how Blasius's theorem calculation changes. OK, so the first thing I need to do is calculate dw by dz. OK, so I get u lots of 1 minus a squared over z squared. And now I also have minus i gamma over 2 pi 1 over z. Okay, and again then from Blasius I can calculate that fx minus i fy is i rho over 2 times the integral around mod z equals a of this thing squared. So u 1 minus a squared over z squared minus i gamma over 2 pi 1 over z all squared dz, okay? Now, of course, I can expand this out and do the integral exactly, but we're quickly going to start to get things that are much more complicated. So what I want to do is think a little bit about where, the one, where any contribution to this integral is going to come from. And so I first of all need to think about what singularities are contained within mod z equals a, okay? And here, the only singularities are at z equals 0, so that's not too bad. And then secondly, I need to think about what the contribution, what the residue of the integrand is going to be at that point. And the residue is defined to be the, the uh, coefficient of 1 over z. So I can see that I'm going to get a 1 over z just from this term multiplied by this 1 here when I, when I do expand things. OK, so I'm going to say that this is i rho over 2 times 2 pi i, that's the term from Cauchy's residue theorem, times the residue of u lots of 1 minus a squared over z squared minus i gamma on 2 pi 1 over z 
squared evaluated at z equals zero. Okay, and I've now lost my integral. Okay, and then just the next step, so I'm going to do some tidying up out here. So minus rho pi. Okay, as I said, I'm looking for where this one over z is going to come from. So I have first of all a factor of two because it's going to be uh, expanding out the. It's a sort of cross term that comes from expanding out this power of two. Okay, then I've got my u from here, this one. And then I've also got minus i gamma over 2 pi. Okay, so I can go around and calculate, I can cancel some 2 pi's and I end up with just rho u gamma, but with a factor of i. Okay, so what we find now is unfortunately, maybe, we find that fx, which is the real part of this expression, is still zero. Okay, so we haven't found a drag force. Okay, there's still no drag force. Okay, so D'Alembert's paradox is still there. Okay, but I do now have a force in the y direction, which is just minus this term, so minus rho u gamma. Okay, so maybe we should try and understand this picture a little bit. Where is this force coming from? Okay, and you might remember as well that in the last lecture we talked about the streamlines around a cylinder with positive circulation. So imagine, so I'm thinking about circulation in this direction. This is gamma positive. Okay, and we showed that the, the, there were two stagnation points both in the upper half plane. So there's one kind of as you go into the cylinder and another one coming out. Okay. And we also showed that sort of the streamlines kind of largely just kind of follow the contour of the cylinder on the, on the outside. Okay, so... And then up here, they sort of get deflected a bit down and then back out. Okay. So the question is, how does this help us understand this result? So this result says that if the circulation gamma is positive, then I should have a, a vertical force that is pushing me down. So kind of a, an anti-lift force. Okay. So... How do I understand that? Well, the, the key is really to think about Bernoulli, which is, after all, where Blasius' theorem comes from, but also to think about what the velocity is doing. And if you think about this, what, what uh, we sort of see is that the stagnation points are at the top of the cylinder, the streamlines are further apart, and so we can say that the speed, the velocity u, or the modulus of u, is decreased up here. Okay, whereas down here it's increased. Okay, and from Bernoulli we know that if mod u is decreased, that means that the pressure is increased. And down here, sorry, I'll just write it here. That means that the pressure is decreased. Okay, so if I think about the pressure, I have a high pressure at the top and a low pressure at the bottom. It's natural then that I get a vertical force kind of pushing me down. Okay, so I'll try and write that in words as well. So if, let's do that over here. So if if gamma is greater than zero, okay, so we've got some anti-clockwise flow around the cylinder, that flow is kind of um, opposing the oncoming flow um, from the uniform stream. And in particular, it does that above the cylinder, which is where the stagnation points are.
Okay, so by Bernoulli's principle, um, there's a higher pressure above the cylinder compared to below. Okay, and that implies that there's a net downwards force. Okay. Now, this is kind of a result that comes from thinking about, we've done a lot of work to think about, first of all, how momentum is conserved, how mass is conserved, um, what the relative uh, relevant boundary conditions are and so on, and then we've thought carefully about how to calculate forces. If you sort of come at this problem sort of maybe more naively and just think about what happens in molecules, if, if the gas is uh, in the area of molecules hitting this cylinder that's kind of spinning, the question is, do you get the same answer? Okay, and what I hope to show you now is that actually you get the opposite answer, that rather than there being a net down force, you might expect there to be a vertical force upwards. Okay, so I'm going to make a note of that now. So this is the opposite of what we might expect from a molecular picture. Okay, so if I was thinking about this and thinking about individual molecules of gas, I'd say that I've got my cylinder going to the left, so molecules of gas are coming from the left to the right in the frame of the cylinder, okay? And I kind of have this picture that the cylinder is spinning, okay? So if a molecule of gas coming from the left hits this thing, it's going to get kicked off in this direction, okay? So these ones are going to get sort of pushed downwards relatively, whereas on the other side, things will be pushed upwards, okay? And then because I'm moving from right to left, okay, there are going to end up being more molecules on the left than on the right. So there are more molecules being pushed down than there are molecules being pushed up on the right. Okay? And so you would then expect that the sort of reaction force of these guys being pushed down would push the cylinder up more than the reaction of these molecules being pushed up would push the cylinder down, okay? And then the sort of consequence of that would be that the force should be upwards. So there's fewer behind the cylinder pushed up Okay, so many molecules ahead of cylinder are pushed down. Okay, and so if you just think about the reaction, okay, so reaction force should be in a positive vertical direction. Okay, so the question then is, well, which of these two points of view is, is right, okay? Okay, should we be thinking about things as, as molecules or should we be thinking about things as a continuum fluid, okay, and this is a bit hard to demonstrate and it may not work very well, but I'll give it a go. The idea is that if I make something spin, okay, then it should curve, okay, and this is, so if I'm gonna, what I'm gonna try and do is hit the table tennis ball somewhere over there, so please catch it, okay, but the idea is that if I make it spin in this direction, okay, then the second idea that I gave you would kick molecules in that direction so you'd expect the table tennis ball to go in that direction 
but if the sort of Bernoulli calculation is correct, then you expect it to curve that way. Okay, does that make sense? So I might I get two goes at this, and I'm not, it's not easy to practice this. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hit it with as much side spin as I can, and then see whether we can agree on which way it curves. Okay, so let's see. I, this is not personal. If it hits you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, I'll try, I'll try one more and then, well, if it doesn't come back, don't worry. Oh, I nearly caught it. But I think, I don't know whether you guys agree, but from, from here at least, it looks very much like it curves, thank you, in that direction. Okay, so we're in the continuum. The continuum picture that we've been developing is at least consistent with that experiment. Okay, and this molecular picture is not wrong, it's just not relevant for air on Earth. Okay, and the issue is really about how far apart the, the molecules are typically. The molecules in air on Earth are very close together, much closer together than the ball, the table tennis ball. If you go somewhere like Mars, where the atmosphere is much thinner, okay, then you start to get a situation where this mean free path, the distance, typical distance that molecules go bef between collisions, is large, and then when it gets large compared to the size of the object, you're considering, then this sign of this force kind of flips. Okay? So this, this last bit is the bit about um, the molecular picture here is not going to be examinable, but I just wanted to check that because we've done a lot of work and it's sort of a slightly counterintuitive result. So I'll just make a note that in a continuum medium, Okay, which is what we're considering in this course. Okay, the Blasius calculation. Gives a correct. Sign of this force. Okay, so in a rarefied gas, that's more like the atmosphere on Mars, okay? And it has a technical definition that we don't, don't need to worry about. The molecular picture is more relevant then. Okay? So we've done a couple of examples for um, the, using Blasius' theorem to calculate the drag force, well, the force on a body in a uniform flow with and without circulation. We've shown that if there's circulation, then you do get a force, but it's not a drag force. Okay, and then the question is, well, do we need to keep trying slightly different combinations or different shapes of boundary, okay, so that we can get a drag force? Is that what's going wrong and is that what's happening with D'Alembert's paradox? And the answer is actually no. We can generalize the essential ingredients that go into the calculation that we did in example one to make a very general statement um, that actually tells us what the lift and drag on a body are. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is state that more precisely. Uh, so I'm going to say we can generalize the discussion of examples one and two. Okay, and that generalization is what's called the Kutajakovsky lift theorem. Okay, so the statement of the lift theorem is that we suppose that there's fluid flowing, okay, and we want to neglect the possibility of there being any singularities in the flow. So we can suppose fluid flows steadily, okay, at speed uh, u past an obstacle. B 
B. Okay, and we're going to think about that obstacle's uh, boundary, so which is so I'm going to say that which is bounded. by a closed curved uh, a closed curve db okay and it's going to have uh, the flow is going to have with circulation gamma so there's going to be some circulation gamma about b But crucially, there are no singularities in the flow. So there's no, um, no vortices, no dipoles, no point sources or sinks. Okay? It's just this uniform flow. Okay, so this is going to be very important. Okay? The statement is that the obstacle experiences no drag. Okay, experiences uh, no drag, but there is a lift force. Okay, and maybe the surprising thing is that the lift force L is exactly what we found up here, just minus rho u gamma. Okay, so this is uh, the statement of the theorem, okay, and the idea in the proof is really that we, well, we can't say anything about what singularities are inside the, inside the boundary, okay? Because we don't know, you know, we don't know what the details of what's going on. We don't know if it's not going to be a circle in general, so we, there's no analogue of the circle theorem that will tell us what combination of singularities to put inside the cylinder, okay? So we can't hope to use the residue theorem in the normal way. We can't hope to just go and calculate it. But a key thing is a bit that I've underlined here, that there are no singularities in the flow. And that's important because it means that I can take my, uh, my contour of integration around the boundary from Blasius' theorem, and I can kind of move it around as I like in the flow because there are no singularities. So I can deform it to whatever I like. And the choice that I'm going to make is to move it away to infinity so that I can just sort of smear out what happens inside the obstacle to just its, um, just its residue, essentially. Okay, and then we'll have to think a little bit about what its residue is going to be and calculate that in terms of, um, in terms of the circulation. But that's the sort of philosophy for the proof. Okay, so there are no singularities... in the flow, okay, but we don't know what singularities are contained inside the obstacles. Okay, so the sort of philosophy is that let's try, well, so we can't use the, sorry, that tells me that I cannot use the residue theorem in the usual way. Okay, however, as I said, we can deform the contour to infinity and again because however because there are no singularities in the flow okay we can deform db to a curve at infinity And I'll say a bit more about what I mean by that in just a second. Okay. Right. So, again, because there are no singularities, we can write 
the Laurent series in a sort of very general form. Okay. Uh, as. Okay, and this is where it's really key that I've moved my contour out to infinity. I've kind of lost the detailed picture about, you know, if there's a point source inside the cylinder and then a point sink a little distance away. I'm not going to see any of that detail, okay? I'm just going to see that dw by dz is going to look like, well, it's going to look like my uniform flow, okay? So it's going to look like u e to the minus i alpha if I have my stream at an angle alpha. Okay, but then the most general thing I can say apart from that is that there are going to be some powers of z, okay, and I'm going to think about the leading term that I care about is the b1 over z, okay, and I'm going to expect to have order 1 over z squared, okay, and this is valid as z goes to infinity, okay. So that's my general, um, the most general thing I can say about the Laurent series. So what I need to do now is I actually need to use Blasius' theorem and try and calculate what this force is going to be. Okay, so I'm just going to do that. Okay, and I'm going to consider a very particular path. When I say this path at infinity, okay, what we do is we let z be r e to the i theta, where r is going to infinity. Okay, so I'm deforming my contour to be some very large circle. Okay, so what do I have? Maybe I'm going to do this over there. So I've got my Laurent series for dw by dz. Now I'm just going to use Blasius' theorem which says that fx minus i fy equals i rho over 2 times the integral. Okay, so I've turned my integral around db into an integral from 0 to 2 pi, okay, of dz, which is going to be i r e to the i theta d theta. And what's my integrand? Well, it's just this Laurent series that I wrote down. So u e to the minus i alpha plus b1 over z. But z is just r e to the i alpha, oh, theta, sorry, uh, plus dot, 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 higher order stuff. Maybe I should write that. That's order 1 over r squared stuff. Okay, and all of this is squared. Okay. So now I can just calculate this, and again it gives you another perspective on the residue theorem. All of the stuff that doesn't have a e to the a one over z in it is just going to be periodic. The stuff that has a one over z in it, you get this e to the i theta cancelling with this e to the i theta, and so there's no periodicity, and you end up picking up a two pi times that term. So here I'm going to get e, oh sorry, i rho over two from here. Okay, and then the question is where in the expansion of this thing squared do I get a 1 over z? And again, it's in the cross term between this uniform stream and this general singularity inside the, inside the obstacle. So I'm going to have to make sure I account for my factor 2 because of the cross term. I've got my u e to the minus i alpha. I've got my b1. And again, I cancel my r's, I cancel my e to the i thetas, and I end up just with a 2 pi i. Okay? So this ends up just being minus 2 pi rho u e to the minus i alpha. Uh, sorry, b1, I need my b1. Okay? So maybe that shouldn't be a surprise. The question is, what is B1? And how am I going to think about what B1 is? Okay. And again, because of the statement of the theorem, we want to keep things as general as we possibly can. Okay? We don't want to be thinking about a particular B1 if I told you what, 
you know, if I just said this is a particular flow, then that wouldn't be so interesting, okay? But the idea is actually I can get a bit of information because while I've calculated the integral of dw by dz squared, that was what I wanted for Blasius' theorem, I can actually just do an integral on dw by dz, okay? And again, using the residue theorem or thinking about my domain, I'll actually get some, it'll be the b1 that will give me that integral. The b one's the only thing that will survive doing this integral, yeah? So that's what I'm going to do. So to think about what b1 is, I'm going to note that the integral around db of dw by dz, dz, is the integral from 0 to 2 pi. Again, I've deformed onto my contour. I don't change the answer. So I've got the uh, u e to the minus i alpha plus b1 over r e to the i theta plus order 1 over r squared stuff. And now there's no squared because I'm just integrating d w by dz directly. I have my i r e to the i theta d theta. Okay. And then again, maybe not surprisingly, I'm just going to find that this is 2 pi i times b1. Okay. That's what I'd expect just from the residue theorem. Okay. So why is this a good idea? Well, it's a good idea because actually I know what dw by dz is physically. I know that this thing is related to, well, it's just u minus iv. It's just a complex velocity. Okay. And I also know that dz is just dx plus i dy. So this is actually just an integral around db of u minus iv times dx plus i dy which again I can just expand out a little bit. So I'm going to think about it in terms of real and imaginary parts. So I've got an integral around db of u dx plus v dy and I've got an integral around db with an i outside okay and I'm going to have u dy minus v dx okay so this is really just calculating the same integral a different way okay maybe it looks like it's a little bit less general way okay but actually these are all quantities that we've thought about before okay so this is just the integral of the, of the vector velocity dotted with dx, okay? And this is just the integral of the vector velocity dotted with n ds, okay? So I'm just going to quickly make a note of that. So this is just u dot dx, and this bit is just u dot n ds, and then we've seen a few times now these quantities. This integral of u dot dx is exactly the circulation. Okay? And the integral of u dot n ds, that's exactly the flux of liquid out of the surface db. Okay? So this in, these integrals are actually exactly gamma plus iq. Okay? Where gamma is the circulation... around B and Q is the flux through B or through DB I guess. Okay so what, we'll, what we've seen is actually this this is all equal to some stuff times B1 and in this course, we're always thinking about things being impermeable, boundaries being impermeable. Okay, so here, okay, we have Q equals zero, okay, because the boundary is impermeable. Okay, so actually now I can just straight away tell you that that means that I get gamma is 2 pi i times b1 
which tells me that B1 is just gamma over 2 pi i, but I'm just going to put the i on top and introduce a minus sign for that. So minus i gamma over 2 pi. Okay. And then if I think about what I wanted to have, sorry, I've lost it now. Just at the top of this board, I've got fx minus ify is exactly minus 2 pi rho u e to the minus i alpha b1. Okay, so I'm just going to write that down. So therefore, fx minus ify equals uh, minus 2 pi rho u e to the minus i alpha uh, times b1, which I now know is minus over 2 pi gamma, okay, uh, da, 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 da. and I've lost an i, was that because, no, there should be an i, right? So there's no i, there's no i in the fx minus i f y, and there is an i in the b1, okay? So this tells me that fx minus i f y equals i rho u gamma e to the minus i alpha. Okay? And then just to sort of finish, I need to think a little bit about, because I've got this stream coming at an angle, I need to sort of convert this x and y force uh, into a lift and a drag. Okay, so I need to remember that I've got my flow coming at an angle alpha to the horizontal, okay? I've just calculated what Fy and Fx are, and what I really want is I want to know what the lift, okay, and the drag, okay? Okay, so then I can write those down in terms of, uh, in terms of the Fx and Fy, so this is minus Fx, sine alpha plus Fy cos alpha, and a drag is just Fx cos alpha plus Fy sine alpha. Okay, just think about what happens when um, alpha goes to zero and so on. Okay, uh, then what I need to do is I, I've cal I can calculate from here what Fx and Fy are. So fx is just going to be um, the real part of this, but because of that i and the minus i sine alpha, I get rho u gamma sine alpha, okay? And I get that fy equals minus rho u gamma cos alpha from the imaginary part and being careful about minus signs, okay? So therefore, my lift is uh, this thing times minus sine alpha, okay, plus this thing times cos alpha, and I end up with just minus rho u gamma with a cos squared plus sine squared, okay, and my drag is this thing times cos plus this thing times sine, and the terms cancel, and I find that d equals zero. Okay, so that concludes the proof of the Kutta-Tchaikovsky uh, lift theorem, okay? And what this tells us is that whatever we do in two dimensions, we're never going to find a drag force, okay? For uniform flow past uh, a two-dimensional cylinder, okay? So it can have whatever contour you like. If it's 2D, you won't get a drag force. Now, of course, that doesn't, that sort of contradicts the experiment I did with a hairdryer and the ping pong ball. And that's because everything we're considering this, in this course is ideal flow. Okay, so there's no viscosity, uh, no turbulence, anything like that. Okay, and so this calculate the sort of formulation that we have won't allow us to calculate what the drag force on a, on a sphere or a cylinder is. If you're interested in that, you should do the part B course viscous flow next year. But it does allow us to calculate other kinds of forces on bodies. So we can't think about uniform streams, maybe. But just to finish the lecture, I want to think about uh, another example. So I'm going to call this example three, just to follow on from the two examples at the beginning of the lecture. 
And this is a doublet, okay, or a dipole, outside the cylinder of radius A. Of radius A. Uh, and the, di the doublet is going to be centered at z equals b. OK. So this, then I'll maybe I'll say that this b is going to be on the real axis just to make our lives a little bit easier. OK. So you see in problem sheet 2, OK, that, this, that the f of z for a doublet is basically what happens when you have a point source and a point sink vanishingly far apart, but with the product of the distance and the flux fixed, okay? And that what you show in the second problem sheet is that the basic uh, complex potential for this is f of z equals mu over z minus b, okay? And in general, mu can be a complex number because it's, you have kind of the direction of the separation between um, between the point source and the point sink. Okay, so the first thing to do is to use Milne-Thompson's circle theorem. Okay, so what we have then is that my W of Z, my complex potential, is the complex potential that I would have had anyway. So that's just F of Z, sorry. So mu divided by z minus b, plus the complex conjugate of this f of z evaluated at a squared over b. Sorry, a squared over z bar. So this ends up being the, compl the complex conjugate of mu divided by a squared over z bar minus b. OK? So I can sort of simplify this a little bit. So I leave my mu over z minus b. And I'm going to keep my mu bar. A and B are both real. I can bring this Z up to the top. Okay. I can also introduce a 1 over B. And that makes this thing be A squared over B minus Z. Okay. And I'm going to make lots of mistakes. If I try and differentiate this thing in front of everyone, I'm going to make lots of mistakes. So I'm going to do one more simplification, which will make my life uh, a little bit easier. OK, and that's just to try and always write things as functions of z minus something. OK, so that's, and I think that's what I'd advise you to do when you're going to do contour integrals as well, is always try and think about this complex potential as being a function of z minus bits. OK, so we have mu over z minus b plus mu bar over b. Actually, I want to turn this into z minus something, so I'm going to flip that sign and make this z minus a squared over b. And then at the top here, I've got this z, but I want to write that as z minus a squared over b plus a squared over b. Okay? And that means now that I can very easily differentiate this thing. Okay, so dw by dz is going to be minus mu over z minus b squared, OK? And then this bit over this bit is just a constant. So when I differentiate, I don't get anything. But then the a squared over b is going to give me something a bit more interesting. So I get plus mu bar a squared over b squared 1 over z minus a squared over b squared, OK? And then I can use Blasius' theorem to write down that fx minus i f y equals i rho over 2, the integral around mod z equals a of this thing all squared, okay, minus mu z minus b squared plus mu bar a squared over b squared. OK, and we're just about out of time, so I'm just going to get this to the place where we know what residue we need to calculate, and we'll talk about it in the beginning of Wednesday's lecture. So I'm going to get a 2 pi i because I'm using the residue theorem. I lose my i, so I get minus pi.
pi rho times the residue. Now, where, what singularities are inside the cylinder? Well, there's a singularity at z equals b, but that's a doublet itself, so that's outside the cylinder. And there's a singularity at z equals a squared over b, that is inside the cylinder, so I need to worry about that. So I'm going to need to calculate on Wednesday morning the residue of this thing squared, so mu over z minus b squared plus mu bar a squared over b squared 1 over z minus a squared over b squared squared at z equals a squared over b. Okay, so that's exactly where we'll pick it up on Wednesday morning. Okay, thank you very much.